What is it about the Spanish and their music? Some have suggested that just as the Spanish sun creates a sharper contrast between light and shade, the temperament of the Spaniard contrasts sharply in its emotional extremes. Superficially, Thomas Luis de Victoria's music can appear austere and distant, but beneath the surface there's an energy and passion which reflects the fact that the Spanish live life to the full. Michelangelo, when asked by the Florentine painter Pontormo how he could best please a Spanish patron, replied that he should show much blood and nails. Such rawness has readily been attributed to Spanish music too. However true this is, it's undeniable that Victoria's music has an intensity and spiritual power which make it uniquely distinctive in a class of its own. Victoria might have found fame as a Jesuit missionary to the New World, like some of his distinguished forebears. As an eminent lawyer, a prosperous merchant, or as a great naval commander. Instead, this choir boy from Avila grew up to be a scholar, mystic, singer, organist, priest, and one of the greatest composers of a golden age of Renaissance polyphony. Victoria wasn't a prolific composer. He left us far less music than Lassus and Palestrina, for example. But unlike Palestrina, almost all his music was published in his lifetime, generally in luxurious editions, spreading his fame and music far and wide beyond the boundaries of Europe and as far as Spain's colonies in South America. Even when set alongside his renowned compatriots Guerrero and Morales, his reputation as the greatest Spanish composer of the 16th century is secure. In 1572, when he was in his early 20s, Victoria published his first music, a sequence of motets. At the head of the collection is the one we've just heard, O Quam Gloriosum, which is probably one of the reasons it's amongst the most performed of Victoria's works. To me, there's an energy and passion to this music which is captivating. Is it because he's Spanish? Is it because he's a different type of person to Palestrina? Or is it the fervour of Victoria who's going to become the priest? Since the really significant music that Victoria is remembered for is connected with Holy Week, that it's all church music and that we aren't going to hear any magicals to lighten the mood, one might get the impression that we're in for a gloomy week. However, I hope to show that this isn't the case at all. There's something joyous and exuberant in Victoria's character which is reflected in his music. The young Victoria rapidly absorbed his heritage of Spanish expression, but it's only when he gets to Rome that he learns how to peg it to the international style, for which we have essentially Palestrina to thank. There's no documentary evidence that Victoria knew Palestrina, but the likelihood that he did is extremely strong. The German college, where Victoria studied, was linked to the Roman seminary, 
and a Roman seminary was where Palestrina worked. In fact, Victoria later took over Palestrina's job at the Roman seminary. Unlike Palestrina, who had a family, Victoria was a devout Jesuit and took holy orders. The Jesuits placed a strong emphasis on classical training, and the fact that Victoria was a strong Latinist and clearly loved setting words shines through in his music. A fine example of this can be heard in a 12-part Magnificat from 1600, a mature and wonderfully ebullient setting of these words. It's set for 12 voices, so three choirs of four voices each, and Victoria starts with each choir answering the other in turn. First choir, then the second, third, second, first, until the words Ecce Enim, for behold, when all 12 voices sing together for the first time. With a lesser composer, this might sound contrived and naive. With Victoria, it's unbelievably exciting. Victoria came from a high-achieving family, which numbered a Jesuit pioneer in Mexico, a merchant who became a nobleman in Italy, a naval commander, lawyers, priests and musicians. He was the seventh of eleven children, and when his father died in 1557, another priestly uncle took charge of the orphan family. By the time Victoria's voice had broken, he had plainly impressed the powers in Avila that he had the makings of someone special so they sent him to Rome for further training. A look at Victoria's output shows a preponderance of music related to the Virgin Mary. The Marian antiphons are, and always were, the backbone of Roman Catholic worship. The Salve Regina, Hail Queen, Mother of Mercy, Life, Sweetness, Our Hope, is an early example of Victoria's synthesis of his Spanish roots with the so-called international style of Palestrina, which he absorbed in Rome. The Jesuits were not particularly well known for their support of music, but the German college in Rome was an exception. As it happens, the first rector of the college was a key musician, and the first constitution of the 1560s says, let care be taken that there be practice in music for voices and instruments in the college for the students who will take pleasure in it. So unusually, in this case, the German college, a Jesuit college, did actually support music at the centre of its liturgical curriculum. By 1572, when Victoria was barely in his mid-twenties, he was in a position to publish his first book of motets. Dedications of collections like this are often quite revealing, and Victoria dedicated this book of motets to Cardinal Otto von Truxess, Bishop of Augsburg, the young Spaniard's first benefactor. At this point, Victoria had three jobs and a lot of friends in high places as a result. He was the director of music at the Aragonese Church in Rome, the trainer of boys in plain chant at the German college, where he himself had only recently been a student, and perhaps most importantly, he was the private director of music to the Bishop of Augsburg, Cardinal Lotto. It was Cardinal Lotto who put up the money for the 1572 Motet publication, and who was therefore its dedicatee. 
The Christmas motet, O Manu Mysterium, from this 1572 collection, is one of Victoria's most endearing creations. It enfolds serenely, richly warm, when it expresses the wonder that even the animals behold the infant in a manger. It was also in Rome that Victoria composed what would prove to be a seminal volume of music for Holy Week, Officium Hebdomade Sancte, which came out in 1585. The publication includes the celebrated Tenebrae responses, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, hymns, motets, the reproaches, the two sets of passion choruses and other music from Palm Sunday to Holy Saturday. Taken together, these pieces represent the most complete cycle of music for Holy Week by any leading Renaissance composer. It is all of a plangent austerity, which, when put alongside his six-voice requiem of 1605, has long been held to represent Victoria and his Spanishness at its best and most typical. Tenebrae is the Latin for darkness, and the liturgies that surrounded him during the performance of the Good Friday responses would have been essentially pitch black with the exception of some candles, exactly 15 as it happens, representing Christ, the 11 apostles and the three Marys. During the course of these services, the candles are extinguished one by one and the service finishes just as dawn comes up. So the setting is remarkable and highly dramatic and Victoria matches it with every texture that he writes, every inflection of every word. For example, in the Good Friday Responsory, Tradiderant May, not a note is wasted and he achieves his own match of function and expressivity. They delivered me into the hands of the ungodly and cast me among the unjust and spared not my life. Victoria was extremely busy with all his roles across Rome, but in 1575, at the age of 27, he took minor orders in a church and seems to have been unusually fast-tracked to the priesthood. Bishop Thomas Goldwell, the last surviving member of the pre-Reformation English Catholic hierarchy in Rome, ordained him priest. Only a few years on, we see Victoria leaving the German college and the Roman college and joining a newly formed community of secular priests, the Congregation of the Oratory. This was a very different order to the Jesuits, bound together by no formal vows, but only with the bond of charity. The founder, Philip Neri, was not necessarily the kind of man you'd expect to run an order. He believed it was more truly Christian to be cheerful than melancholy, which does seem to fit in with Victoria's character. In 1583, Victoria dedicated a sumptuous book of masses to King Philip II of Spain. 
In his dedication, Victoria made a personal appeal which wasn't about financial support at all. After 20 years in Rome, now accounting for half the span of his life, Victoria felt the pull of his homeland and wrote of his exhaustion from years of musical toil. He wanted, he told the king, to lead a quiet life back in Spain, to put an end to my labour of composing, to rest for a time in honest leisure, and to be able to compose my soul in contemplation as befits a priest. Victoria had been ordained whilst he was living in the Eternal City, so it wasn't a matter of money. For some years Victoria had earned a substantial income from Spain since Pope Gregory had conferred several Spanish benefices on him. From Philip's point of view, there was the advantage of Victoria bringing with him a whole cartload of exquisite music for the court chapel. The motet, Trime Poste, comes from a collection of motets published in Rome in 1585. The opening words, Draw Me After You, is based on a double canon, but despite this apparently rigid technical grand plan, the general effect of the music is one of gracious and flowing sweetness. Victoria's homesick appeal to Philip II paid off, and he was offered the post of chaplain to the king's sister, the Dowager Empress Maria. Daughter of Charles V, wife of Maximilian II and mother of two emperors, at the royal convent of barefoot clerist nuns in Madrid. This consisted of 33 strictly cloistered nuns who heard mass daily in an exquisite small chapel attended by priests who were required to be accomplished singers of plain chant and polyphony. The chaplains enjoyed a number of benefits, including a personal servant, meals served in their private quarters next to the convent, and a month's holiday a year. In actual fact, in the early 1590s, Victoria took considerably more time off over several years. He went to Rome to supervise the publication of his music, and he went to Palestrina's funeral. Life at the convent held such advantages for Victoria that no Spanish cathedral could tempt him. The elite of Madrid often went to services at the convent, where his works were regularly sung. Victoria's solemn double choir setting of Veni Sancti Spiritus is included in a mixed collection of his masses, Magnificat, Psalms and other pieces, published in Madrid in 1600. Twenty masses by Victoria have survived compared to 104 by Palestrina. 
While Palestrina's masses often seem to float, suspended in a kind of celestial ether, Victoria's music strikes one as more muscular, propelled by an infectious and fervent sense of energy and vigour, and with a glowing vibrancy of colours. The nine-voice battle mass, or Missa Pro Victoria, of 1600 stands alone. It's not unusual in that it's a parody mass, that is, it's based on a pre-existent piece of polyphony, because Victoria did that a lot. But what Victoria did in every other case was to base it on a pre-existent sacred piece. However, the Missa Pro Victoria is based on a 16th century French chanson, La Guerre, by the composer Janequin, about the Battle of Mariano of 1515. Not suitable for daily worship, Victoria's Mass seems to have been composed for a special occasion, probably for Prince Philip III, to whom Victoria's last book of Masses was dedicated. The original chanson is a wonderfully theatrical piece where the singers are imitating cavalry and cannons, with swords and shields clattering against each other. The way Victoria paints his music with the sound of battle and yet makes it suit the context of the mass is wonderfully inventive. Exactly the same words and rhythms used for musket fire and swords clashing in La Guerre are slowed down and set to the Don and Abis Parchen. Grant us peace in the Arnius Dei. The Empress Maria clearly liked and respected Victoria, and on her death in 1603, she arranged for him to inherit an endowed chaplaincy. However, he sold it so that he could pay for a really lavish printing of his celebrated 1605 work, The Office for the Dead, composed in her memory. This way he could remember his friend and employer without missing an opportunity for some self-promotion. The Requiem's mystical intensity of expression achieved by the simplest musical means, set it apart from contemporary English and Italian music and has led to comparisons with the equally intense religious paintings of Velasquez and El Greco. The drama inherent in a text clearly brought out the best in Victoria and there was no better text for a committed Catholic priest to set. In a requiem you've got the standard elements, introit, Kyrie, Gradual, Offertory, Sanctus, Benedictus, Agnus Dei, Lux Eterna and Liberame. But Victoria's unusual take includes the first movement, Ted et Anima Meum, I am weary at the heart of my life, and the penultimate movement, Versa Est in Luctum. The reason why these movements are important is that the work is modelled on a requiem that he wrote earlier, but not these two movements. So it's possible to suggest that the last music that Victoria wrote were these two settings, and in particular the verse Est in Luctum, whose text is so appropriate to the musician. My harp is tuned to mourning, and my organ to the voice of those who weep. What is most touching about this music is Victoria's audible belief in a loving, forgiving God. It's ultimately humane music, it's honest, it's fervent, and at the same time as being a requiem, it's a celebration of life. To Victoria the priest and devoted church musician, it's nothing less than a gateway to his and everyone else's eternal life. <laughs> 